Welcome all to a very special Animal of the Week, the yearly Animal of the Shark Week. This year's shark is a very special one, famous for its amazing ability to walk on land. It's the Epulet Shark. The reason for this name is pretty clear when we look at its body markings. The big spot on its side is reminiscent of military epaulets, as they are just behind the front fin and so I guess kind of on the shoulder if it had a true shoulder. I think that's actually a really cute name and very fitting. But like all organisms, it has its less cute and more professional name, Hemicillium oscillatum. Its genus name is very similar to the family name Hemiciliidae, and coming from this family makes it a type of long tail carpet shark which is sometimes changed to bamboo shark. There are actually five other species of different epaulet shark, like the Henry's epaulet shark or the Mine Bay epaulet shark, but for the sake of simplicity I'll focus just upon the vanilla epaulet shark and not the other flavours because they are all incredibly similar species. The epaulet shark dwells in the ocean off the north of Australia and coast of Papua New Guinea. They get as far south as Sydney and the huge numbers are found on the Great Barrier Reef. On a micro scale they enjoy very shallow water venturing no deeper than 50 metres and a lot of the time lying in rock pools barely deep enough for their bodies. To make things more difficult for themselves they are largely nocturnal and lie around in tidal pools during the night which is very dangerous as tidal pools lose oxygen very fast during the night as they are small areas and photosynthesis isn't taking place place during the dark. When they aren't tempting fate in tidal rock pools they enjoy coral reefs as they are excellent hunters and that is where much of their food lives. These sharks are very small at less than a metre in length and so prey upon small things like tiny coral dwelling bony fish and invertebrates. They are very opportunistic predators meaning their diet is wide and depends mainly upon what is near them that they can hunt. Juveniles that have little experience being predators have diets largely consisting of polycate worms as these are slow and some species even stationary, while adults eat crustaceans and fish. They are largely crepuscular in their hunting patterns, liking to hunt at dawn and dusk. As they are so opportunistic they have adapted many ways of hunting a wide variety of prey. Small fish can be sucked into their mouths by the expansion of their buccal cavity. Crustaceans are dug out with their snouts and they will sometimes even filter feed on sand to get at the tiniest zooplankton expelling the excess sand out of their gills. Due to preying upon many crustaceans, these sharks are able to depress their teeth in order to create a more flat surface for crushing through shells, and chew their food extensively for up to 10 minutes before swallowing. Interestingly, in these sharks the females pursue the males, and quite literally. The females initiate intercourse by chasing the males and biting their tails. Once courted, the male bites onto the female's pectoral fin, lies beside her and uses his claspers to get a firm grip. These sharks are oviparous, meaning they lay eggs, and the females sure do a lot of laying. They only lay two eggs at a time, but will keep laying them every two weeks for about four to six months from July to December at the furthest extent. This results in from 20 to 50 eggs laid each year on average, taking into account variations between individuals such as mating times and the occasional 4 eggs laid at once. It's not an exact science. Development takes 140 days, in which time the embryo will have grown and hatches at about 6 inches in size. Now on to the unique and fun part. As I mentioned before, these sharks are capable of two very amazing adaptations, walking on land and surviving in very low oxygen environments in tidal pools. But how do they do these two things? Let's explore the low oxygen adaptation first. To survive at night in shallow tidal pools, the sharks have the amazing ability to shut off unnecessary organs, as well as dilate their blood vessels to allow more oxygen flow to the heart and brain. Blood pressure falls dramatically and the heart pumps slowly but hard. They can also slow their metabolic rate in different regions of the brain. When they are lying in a pool they don't need complex motor functions and so can deactivate their motor neurons but keep their sensory neurons functioning to keep it aware of its surroundings but avoid neuron death. They have been observed under lab conditions to be able to survive without any oxygen at all for up to an hour because of these amazing abilities. They can survive in these very anoxic environments but why and how do they go there in the first place? They enter tidal pools because they offer a great deal of safety for the shark and also an abundance of food that is isn't able to escape them. Also a lot of time they just simply find themselves in these pools coincidentally because they live in such shallow water and the tide goes out. But it takes a huge amount of effort to be able to come out of the water and get to them. That is why the areas around the pectoral and pelvic fins are packed with dense muscle giving them a great amount of strength for their body size. The pectoral fins themselves are also long and rounded to be able to grip well and pull themselves forward like oars. There is one more fascinating adaptation that I haven't talked much about and that is what they get their name from. 
the epaulette coloration on their sides. Many of you may have already guessed what this is for, and you'd be right if you said camouflage. The dark patches look like eyes to its predators, which can confuse and deter attacks. This form of camouflage is unsurprisingly called eye spots. Obviously I just mentioned that they do have predators. These mainly consist of larger sharks, as the epaulette shark is less than a meter long. Interestingly, they also have a parasite problem, with almost all individuals being parasitized by larval gnathid isopods, which feed upon their blood. However, not enough to cause any damage to the sharks, and they usually go on living with no real problems. The IUCN classes them as least concern, as they are not commercially fished on a large scale. A lot are bred in captivity, as people like to keep them in aquariums due to their small size and small range. However, However, rising sea temperatures do threaten them, as the speed at which they develop and their overall health is very much dependent upon temperature, and too high a temperature can disrupt this. Thank you for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you'd like to learn more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you'd like to see more from us.